Hello, and welcome to our Reception Studies Society panel titled New Geographies of Reception. My name is Kelsey Squire, and I'm an Associate Professor of English at Ohio Dominican University in Columbus, Ohio. I'm the president of the Reception Studies Society, and I am also the chair of this panel. For today's session, the Reception Studies Society invited panelists to consider the new geographies of reception. Recent work in reception study has drawn increased attention to new critical insights and methodologies concerning the geography of reading. This panel invites participants to consider how reception may be informed by issues of place and space. Panelists were invited to explore, but weren't limited to, several different questions, including what are the conflicts and contrasts that occur between local, regional, national, and or global reception of texts? How do reading environments impact reception? In what ways is reception rooted in a particular place? And in what ways does reception defy, break, or transform boundaries? This year has been a difficult one, and unfortunately, two of our panelists needed to withdraw from presenting in June. I am excited, however, to share with you the, the work of Matthew Herman. He is Associate Professor of Native American Studies at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. He is the author of Politics and Aesthetics in Contemporary Native American Writing Across Every Border which was published by Rutledge in 2010. His scholarship has also appeared in Studies in American Indian Literatures and Modern Fiction Studies. Matthew's paper for today is titled Native American Literary Studies and Geographies of Reading. In this paper, he illuminates how contemporary indigenous writers are pointing to the dispossessatory logics and steadler violence of value that characterize how socio-geographical reception patterns are treated in their work. Specifically, he discusses the poetry of Kim Shuck and playwright William Yellow Robe Jr.'s The Star Quilter. And now I'll turn it over to Matthew. Good day. Thanks for joining me. My name is Matt Herman and I teach in the Native American Studies Department at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. We are gathered here today However, virtually on the unceded lands of numerous tribal peoples, <clears throat> we acknowledge that MSU is founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous nations, including those whose land on which we meet today virtually. We are committed to beginning a process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and recognize American Indians as contemporary cultures and societies. The title of this paper is Indigenous Literary Studies and Geographies of Reception. In the recent Why Indigenous Literatures Matter from 2018, Cherokee scholar and writer Daniel Heath Justice offers a moving and at times deeply personal statement on the worth of indigenous literary traditions. Justice explains how story pervades every aspect of Native life, so much so that its centrality could even be described as existential. Justice writes, According to the settler stories of indigenous deficiency, our people were supposed to vanish into the sunset long ago. Our family's stubborn refusal to disappear has vexed and perplexed colonial apologists for centuries, for in spite of all their hopes and ambitions, policies and practices, laws and customs and assaults and editorials, our peoples are still here as are our relations as are our stories. In fact, our stories have been integral to that survival. More than that, they have been part of our cultural, political, and familial resurgence and our continuing efforts to maintain our rights and responsibilities in these contested lands. They're good medicine. They remind us about who we are and where we're going on our own and in relation to those with whom we share this world. They remind us about the relationships that make a good life possible. Justice's book is an important achievement in the social analysis of indigenous literatures. While many of Justice's insights will be familiar to readers who belong to communities in which native literary traditions are practiced, and to readers who are students and scholars of indigenous literatures, the book is special because it gathers 
all of these diverse thoughts and feelings into one single place. As the first book-length treatment on the topic of indigenous literary value, the social meanings and functions of indigenous literary value are now front and center as never before. Why Indigenous Literatures Matter inaugurates a scholarly agenda on these topics while also becoming their definitive statement. For scholars who are interested in questions of value, reading, and reception, Justice's work is, an, is important because it aims to give a full account of what Indigenous literatures mean to Indigenous peoples on the basis of Indigenous understandings. <clears throat> a completely full account of why Indigenous literatures matter, however, would require a project of much greater magnitude. Indigenous literatures today are world literature. Native and Indigenous literary studies is an international institutional formation. Books, stories, and poems by Native authors are read, reviewed, studied, and taught all over the world. What are the various ways Indigenous literatures matter to all of these diverse readers when reading if they are not reminded of the relationships that make a good life possible? Then what are they thinking about? What value do they place on Indigenous literatures? How do they read them and why? Heretofore, scholarship on these other kinds of reading and valuing questions has been scant. While exceptions can be found, like Crow Creek scholar Elizabeth Cookland's writing on literary cosmopolitanism, and Ojibwe novelist and scholar David Troyer's work on culturalist and exoticist reading practices, it is in the work of Native writers themselves where one finds the most sustained treatment of these issues. Certainly ways of reading, reception patterns, and systems of value vary greatly, complicating any definitive comprehensive understanding, but there, in the creative work itself, one can find a discernible focus on a spatial sociology of reception and value that revolves around a cultural politics of difference between opposed communities of reception. In their work, Native writers note how social and cultural locations are tied to particular habits of reception and related habits of taste, and they point as well to the settler violence of value through which these sociogeographical reception patterns exert their force and are lived and felt. This paper aims to highlight and describe some of these examples in the hope that the attention of scholars, first of all, might help advance in some way the development of reception studies and literary sociology within indigenous literary studies, and second, might inspire scholarship, teaching, and activism to dismantle the violent tendencies of settler reading practices. Two primary texts sampled in this presentation are Cherokee poet Kim Shuck's The Great Urban Indian Poem from the 2014 chapbook Sidewalk Indian and Dakota playwright William S. Yellowrobe Jr.'s The Star Quilter from the 2000 collected volume Where the Pavement Ends. Shuck's short poem discusses the impossibility of urban native poetry due to the ways Situated racialist reading practices render urban space unreadable as native textual space. Yellow Robe's short play maps a socially variegated geography stretching from the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in eastern Montana to a U.S. Senate office that sets the stage for an extended meditation on the situated reading practices used by native and non-native communities when assigning meaning and value <clears throat> to native cultural products. Both texts are about the implications of the settler reception of native texts and material culture, and how the nature of that reception can be both violent and geared towards the reconfiguration of native property and propriety. Kim Shuck's <clears throat> The Great Urban Indian Poem is a satirical poem about the impossibility of urban Indian poetry. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, there is great urban Indian poetry. Shuck's poem in particular is a wonderful example. Shuck's point, rather, is that under the prevailing social conditions of reading and evaluating Native American poetry, qualities like great urban Indian and poetry are mutually incompatible, mutually canceling even. In the poem, Shuck mentions how the great urban Indian poem has already been written and is even ongoing, but, quote, people missed it and continue to, quote, miss it for a whole host of reasons listed in the poem. There will never be a, a release party or even a book. 
Deb Isle, the Cowlitz, former lead singer of the 80s post-punk band Romeo Void, will not play the event. One of the poets has no CD IB card, and the other is from an unrecognized band, and it will not be reviewed or published in a sanctioned literary journal. Readers of Native American literatures might notice the allusion in Chuck's title to Sherman Alexie's 1994 poem, How to Write the Great American Indian Novel, which is another satirical poem about the impossibility of Native literary greatness. <clears throat> In the famous final stanza, which reads, In the great American Indian novel, when it is finally written, all of the white people will be Indians, and all of the Indians will be ghosts, end quote, the settler literary value of greatness equates in practice to a form of cannibalizing body swaps when applied to the context of the native novel. According to the poem, literary greatness will be assigned when and only when the American Indian novel has completely internalized white subjectivity. For Shuck, settler literary value <clears throat> is a source of a similar kind of violence. In this case, case, the violence of various dislocations. In the context of urban native literature, the acquisition of poetic greatness is only made possible through st stringent guidelines like those I just cited from the poem. Things like official tribal enrollment status and official recognition in a sanctioned literary organ. The poem ends by asking the readers to, quote, pay attention, because if you hear Jim Pepper in the background, you might be close, end quote. For Shuck, it is Jim Pepper, K. Ka, Creek saxophonist, singer, composer, and urban native from Portland, Oregon, known for his unique American Indian jazz and for bringing Native American music's into jazz and other mainstream genres, whose innovative approach to indigenizing Western musical forms provides the proper cultural context, or perhaps the right cultural map for locating, for getting us close to the great urban Indian poem. <clears throat> Shuck's poetic ruminations on the violence of settler poetic value calls to mind Ray Chow in the Protestant Ethnic and the Spirit of Capitalism from 2002, where Chow lays out a theory of liberal multiculturalist violence and the ethnic subject. For Chow, as today's white politically correct subject disavows the racist violence in its earlier, more open and brutal forms, the result is not the absence or diminishment of racial violence, but rather <clears throat> its perpetuation through stratification and displacement. While the liberalist social ethics of multiculturalism open spaces for the ethnic voice, Legitimation in the form of diversity is actually limited by, quote, mechanisms of regulation of administration, end quote. Chow also identifies a complicated corresponding, quote, self-loathing emotional structure, end quote, that has come about since, quote, the old rigid polarization of social identities based on racial difference have supposedly given way to a new situation in which those who were colonized have now gained the right to self-determination. End quote. <clears throat> this situation paradoxically, quote, ends up directing rancor towards certain members of one's own ethnic group, end quote. These symptoms of what Chow calls the politics of ethnicity in post-colonial modernity are present in Chuck's poem as symptoms of the prevailing social conditions of reading and evaluating Native American literature. For instance, the imposition of settler aesthetic categories that regulate what gets read, what does not, what counts as great, and the displacement of racial violence <clears throat> into internal rancor directed against poets, for example, without CDIB cards. What and who can count as native? What can count as native poetry? And what can count as a great urban Indian poem, as Shuck shows, are not simple self-evident matters, but socially and spatially regulated determinations tied to settler systems of reading and assigning value. Those urban natives in particular who dare to write poetry face a specialized, spatialized, and racialized violence that displaces identity and regulates value according to settler standards. The Star Quilter 
by William S. Yellowrub Jr. is a short one-act play. The story structure and plot of the Star Quilter are fairly simple. Mona Gray is a tribal member living on a Montana Indian reservation. She is dedicated to her family and her tribe and is well known for her star quilts, which she gives away to honor people on special occasions. Moan Jorgensen is a non-native second generation Montanan from a farming family who lives in the nearby border town. The play's one act features four scenes following the relationship between the two characters over the course of roughly 30 years from the late 1960s to 1992 in a deliberate chronology that coincides with momentous episodes in contemporary U.S. Native history. Scene 2, in the early 1970s, reflects on Wounded Knee. Scene 3, in the mid-1980s, reflects on Native life during the Reagan era. And Scene 4, in 1992, uses the aura of the Colombian Quincentennial for its backdrop. Essentially, the play is a series of extended dialogues between Mona and Luann. The context for these four dialogues revolves around Luann's exploitative efforts over the years to acquire star quilts from Mona and other reservation quilters for her various business projects, and Mona's social, ethical, and emotional struggles with the exploitation <clears throat> and with Luann's chronic ignorance, occasional indifference, and constant disrespect toward Native peoples and cultures. The plot, <coughs> excuse me, the plot, as bare and schematic as it is, moves toward resolution of the conflict between the two characters. Like all the others, the fourth and final scene takes place in Mona's house on the res. As always, Luann drops by unannounced, presumably looking for another star quilt for another scheme. <coughs> it is 1992. Both women are now quite old and Mona has gone blind from complications from diabetes. After looking back on their relationship over the years, the play ends with an extended monologue from Mona in which she finally calls out Luann for all the self-interested disregard she has shown to her and all Indian people. But the play also ends with Mona wrapping her shawl around Luann's shoulders. Luann is moved enough by Mona's words and and the gesture to ask, Mona, can we ever be friends? I feel so empty and cold. Mona replies, warm yourself, Luann. At least it could be a start. And thus the play concludes. While the play as a whole sustains the tone of cautious optimism struck in its final line regarding the possibility for some kind of affirmative cultural rapprochement, the thematic arc of the play does nothing to mitigate the violence of value Luann and her exploitative settler colonial attitudes toward Native peoples, cultures, and aesthetic traditions and practices impose upon Mona and her guiding system of value. Previous commentators on the play have remarked upon the cultural value, have remarked upon the cultural value particulars, star quilts, and the quilting process add to the play's interest in its dominant theme of correcting cross-cultural misunderstandings. For instance, Deborah Weigel claims, quote, Mona's quilts are more than commodities in society. They become conceptual devices that link her to family members, present her personal autobiography, and express her love and genuine concern for others, end quote. The cultural meaning of star quilts, of course, <clears throat> contrasts sharply with Luann's motivations and actions to acquire the quilts, which not only commodifies star quilts, what Weigel refers to as the interference of the land, but first add value to the quilts by restatusing them with a kind of exotic authenticity. Because of this, it is not enough for us to say the land regards native star quilts as either art or as craft. Yellow Robe shows how this descriptive and analytical power of this distinction falls apart due to a settler colonial process of valuation shown in the play that is not based on the status of the object as art or as craft, but instead as something closer to culture, a kind of cultural capital. Yellow Road thus shows how Luann's pursuit of Mona Stark quilts is not just exploitation, but extra exploitation, value-added exploitation, and herein lies a source of violence based on a social geography of difference. <clears throat> Here's an example. 
The first star quilt Luann acquires from Mona is a gift for a Montana Senator Fletcher to take back to Washington to display on a wall in his Senate office. Luann, the chairwoman of the Senator's local re-election committee, is interested in buying the quilt because, as she says, it would be, quote, something that's different from all the other western states senators, end quote, and because when people see it, quote, they'll know he's from Montana. When Luann learns from Mona, who is initially reluctant to sell a quilt, that star quilts have ceremonial significance, Luann's drive to buy a star quilt only intensifies, quote, the senator would really cherish this star quilt if he knew it was a ceremonial blanket, end quote. When Luann learns Mona is refusing to give her the quilt because she is making it expressly for her nephew's giveaway, she asks Mona to make a new one. Quote, we only want one blanket for the senator. It shouldn't be hard for you to make. End quote. For Luann, the ceremonial significance of the one quilt is easily transferable to another. In The Economy of Prestige, James English discusses the social process of capital interconversion, transactions between cultural and economic, cultural and social, or cultural and political capital, substitutions, even modifications of forms of value. <clears throat> capital interconversion features prominently in the Star Quilter. The conflicted relationship between Mona and Luann can be read as an allegory of the violence of settler colonial capital interconversion. Luann's exploitative practices seek to convert the local, culturally saturated social meaning of Mona's quilts into political capital, both for herself and her personal interests, and for Senator Fletcher, whose display of the quilt on the wall of his Washington Senate office converts its culturally specific value into a valuable image that signifies both an authentic Montana identity and political inclusivity one that masks his partisan efforts in his role as senator, which are described in the play, that provide no return to local Montana Native American political interests, much less the interests of Native women quilters. As the play also demonstrates, <clears throat> a side effect of the capital interconversion of cultural value is violence. There is, of course, the blatant economic violence of the exploitation itself, most forcefully shown in scene two, which in, involves Luann's self-serving scheme to market and sell locally made star quilts in big metropolitan markets like New York City, a project that ends up, unsurprisingly, bringing back no profits to the reservation quilters. And there are other forms of the violence takes as well, which include the general violence of native political underrepresentation that the play highlights, the social shaming Mona receives from her community for agreeing to make the star quilt for Senator Fletcher in the first place, and for them giving Luann Lu the names of other reservation quilters for her business idea, <clears throat> and the more subtle emotional violence we see Mona suffering on a personal level as she struggles to process being dehumanized, othered, and finally, quote, let off her path, the right path, end quote, by Luann. <clears throat> Yellow Robe says the star quilter was the hardest play to write because, quote, it is about his mother, the art and cultural tradition of star quilting, which he practiced, and his experience growing up on the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in northeastern Montana. He also says that it is always surprising, quote, to meet people from Montana outside the state and see their lack of knowledge of Montana's native nations, end quote. As Yellow Robe shows us in his play, <clears throat> there is nothing innocent about a lack of knowledge. The social geography of reception the star quilter establishes between the reservation, the border town, and the Senate office in Washington serves to highlight how regulated hierarchies of taste, value, and expectation not only produce different meanings for different interpretive communities, but under today's settler colonialism, such differences serve settler interests while harming Native lives. The social phenomena Yellow Robe and Shuck identify in their creative texts might not match up with the reasons justif Justice gives in his book for why indigenous literatures matter, but they are important to note and to understand. They involve a different set of logics that correspond 
to a different set of coordinates within the field of indigenous literatures. Thanks to Justice's book, there is now an opening for critical projects to rethink matters of reception, value, and meaning relative to indigenous literatures. Writers like Shuck and Yelderobe can show us ways to conduct this rethinking. Thanks very much. I appreciated learning about several of the texts that Matthew discussed in his presentation. Why Indigenous Literatures Matter by Daniel Heath Justice, Kim Shuck's The Great Urban Indian Poem, and William Yellowrobe Jr.'s The Star Quilter were all new to me, and I can't wait to add them to my reading list. In thinking about these texts and our panel theme, I was really struck by how both authors grapple with the issues of belonging and identity in relation to geography or place through their work. Both the poetic speaker in Shuck's poem and Mona in The Star Quilter focus on artistic creators, and I appreciate how Matthew illuminated some of the different textures of place that occur in each work, but that ultimately how both authors are engaged in similar acts of self-definition through place. One of the important questions in Matthew's presentation um, for me was how do diverse readers respond to texts by Indigenous writers? I appreciate how Matthew acknowledged the violence that might be present in the reception of diverse texts. I found myself thinking about the ethics of readership and how texts like Why Indigenous Literatures Matter might be used as ways for readers to uncover the impact of reception and maybe circumvent some of that violence. If you are interested in issues of reception, I encourage you to check out the Reception Study Society. Our journal, Reception, Texts, Readers, Audiences, and History, is published annually by Penn State University Press. If you are interested in joining the Reception Study Society mailing list, you can also contact me to be added. Thank you for attending our presentation today, and I hope that you enjoy your ALA conference this week. Bye, everyone.